pelvic diaphragm which is also known as pelvic floor you can see the various cavities it is the pleural and pericardial cavities in the thorax then the peritoneal cavity within the abdomen with its extension into the pelvis so there is what is known as the abdominal pelvic cavity the boundary between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity which you are seeing is the diaphragm this is the diaphragm so there is another diaphragm between the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity and that diaphragm is known as the pelvic diaphragm or the pelvic floor so the pelvic diaphragm separates the pelvic cavity from the perineum let us define the pelvic diaphragm it's a gutter shaped hammock like muscular partition around the midline pelvic contents that is the urethra vagina and anal canal and this pelvic diaphragm separates the pelvic cavity from the perineum so it's a gutter shaped hammock like muscular partition that separates pelvic cavity from the perineum and it is seen around the midline contents of the pelvis that is the urethra vagina and anal canal in this picture you can see the muscle that is the levator anae which forms the pelvic diaphragm or the pelvic floor and it is a gutter shaped muscular partition and it is around the midline contents which you are seeing or the urinary bladder and its continuation urethra will be there and then in the case of vagina females vagina will be seen and then posteriorly the anal canal is there so the structures that are passing from the pelvis to the perineum they are passing through this muscular diaphragm that is the pelvic diaphragm and its lateral wall we can see the obturator internus muscle so the pelvic floor is formed by levator ana muscle and there is one more muscle known as the coccygeus these two muscles form the pelvic diaphragm the components of the pelvic diaphragm are the structures that are contributing for its formation or two muscles on each side and two fascia enclosing the muscles the two muscles are the levator anae and coccygeus muscles there are two components in the levator anae muscle that is the pubococcygeus and ilio coccygeus the coccygeus muscle is also known as the ischio coccygeus among the two muscles the levator anae and coccygeus the levator anae contributes for the anterior part of the pelvic diaphragm and the posterior part is the coccygeus muscle so from anterior to posterior you will be seeing the levator anae muscle of which the pubo coccygeus part followed by the ilio coccygeus part and then the posteriorly is the coccygeus or ischio coccygeus muscles which you have seen in this picture and you can see the two openings also the anal opening posteriorly and the urethral orifice anteriorly in the case of males and in the case of females there will be the vagina posterior 
to the urethral orifice. The two fascia enclosing the muscles are the superior fascia of pelvic diaphragm which faces towards the pelvic cavity and the inferior fascia of pelvic diaphragm that faces towards the perineum. The pelvic diaphragm it separates the pelvic viscera above from the perineum and ischiorectal fossa below and it is pierced by the rectum, urethra and vagina in the case of females. In this picture you can understand the levator anne muscle which forms a gutter and then the obturator internus muscle you are seeing. So from which it also takes origin from the fascia covering the obturator internus muscle which forms a tendinous arc. And then here you are seeing the obturator internus covered by its own fascia and between these two that is the levator anne and the obturator internus will be the ischio rectal fossa. So for which the levator anne forms a boundary. Now let us look into the muscles that are contributing for the pelvic floor or pelvic diaphragm. This is the in the midline anteriorly is the pubic symphysis and in the midline posteriorly is the sacrum and the tip of coccyx you are seeing and this is the boundary between the greater pelvis and lesser pelvis. You can see two openings here they are in the pelvic diaphragm. The anterior one is called the urogenital hiatus. The posterior one is called the rectal hiatus. Through the urogenital hiatus, the urethra and the vagina will be extending into the perineum. And through the rectal hiatus, the rectum, its continuation, the anal canal will be opening into the perineum at the anal opening. Then there is the perineal body which will be seen between the two hiatuses. The perineal body is a fibromuscular structure into which nearly 10 muscles are attached. And there is what is known as anococcygeal raphe extending from the posterior margin of the anal opening towards the coccyx into which the muscles of the pelvic diaphragm will get attached. Then if you see the lateral attachment of the pelvic diaphragm, it is attached to the ischiopubic ramus, the ischial spine, the arcus tendinus, which is the fascia covering the obturator internus from which the musculature of the pelvic diaphragm takes origin, especially the pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus parts. They take origin from it. From the ischio, the ischiococcygeus takes origin. In this picture, you are seeing the different components with different colors. The pubococcygeus part, it has several components. The components that are shown in this picture or the pubo rectalis part which surrounds the rectum at the anorectal junction forming a sling. Then you are seeing the other component of the pubo coccygeus is the pubo vesicaris in relation with the bladder or the prostate or the vagina in the case of females. Then you are seeing the iliococcygeus part. And between these two, you are seeing the proper pubococcygeus 
muscle which will be going towards the sacrum and then the coccyx. This is the iliococcygeous part and posterior most is the ischiococcygeous part which you are seeing in this picture. So this is about the various muscles and their attachments. The levator MA is a broad sheet of muscle having two components. The anterior thick part nearer to the pubis is the pubococcygeous part which takes origin from the pubis. The other one is the posterior which is known as the iliococcygeous and is thin and it takes origin from the ilium. The pubococcygeous and iliococcygeous they take origin in a linear fashion starting from the pelvic surface of body of pubis to the ischial spine and in between them from the tendinous arc or white line of pelvic fascia or arcus tendinous which is a condensed obturator fascia. So the pubococcygeus takes origin from the anterior half of arcus tendinous and the iliococcygeus from the posterior half. In addition, the iliococcygeus takes origin from the ilium. In this picture, you can see the various components of the levator MA. This is the pubococcygeus part, then this is the iliococcygeus part, then behind you are seeing the ischiococcygeus or coccygeus part with the two hiatuses, the urogenital hiatus with the urethra in the case of male and the urethra and posterior to it vagina in the case of females and in the posterior part the rectum you are seeing. The insertion of the pubococcygeus. It is into several segments. The pubococcygeus proper that is the most of posterior fibers. They get inserted into the anococcygeal raphe and tip of coccyx. And there is a puborectalis part which forms a string around the rectum at the junction of the rectum with the anal canal. Then there is the puboanalis part which gets inserted into the wall of anal canal. The other component is the pubovesicalis or the pubovesinalis part which gets inserted into the perineal body. The iliococcygeus gets inserted into the anococcygeal raphe and the lower two pieces of coccyx. In this picture, you can see the extension of the levator and a muscle from the anterior to the posterior that is starting from the posterior surface of the pubic symphysis and then to the tip of coccyx and passing through around the structures that is the urethra, the vagina and the rectum forming the slings around these structures. So which are named as the pubococcygeus, the puborectalis and analis, the pubovesicalis or vaginalis. Now let us see what is anococcygeal raphe which is also known as the post anal plate and it extends from the anorectal junction to the coccyx and it is a muscular fibrous structure and it is layered. So from above downwards it is a, having the various layers that is the presacral fascia, the pubococcygeous part which is tendinous, the ileo 
coccygeous part which is a muscular raphe and the sphincter and a externus the superficial fibers of which will get attached to this anococcygeal raphe in this picture again you can revise the various components of the levator ani that is the pubo rectalis part pubo coccygeous part the ilio coccygeous part and the coccygeous muscle posterior the you are seeing now let us learn about the coccygeous part which is also known as the ischio coccygeous and it is triangular in shape and the degenerated part of this muscle is the sacrospinous ligament its origin is from the ischial spine and sacrospinous ligament and it is inserted into the upper two pieces of coccyx and the last piece of sacrum and it is supplied by fourth and fifth sacral nerves and in this picture you can see this is the pubo coccygeous part this is the ilio coccygeous part and this is the ischio coccygeous part which is taking origin from the ischial spine and sacrospinous ligament getting inserted into the last piece of sacrum and the upper two pieces of coccyx this is the table for revising the three muscles of the pelvic diaphragm that is the pubo coccygeous ilio coccygeous and ischio coccygeous the pubo coccygeous has several parts starting from posterior to anterior they are the pubo coccygeous proper pubo rectalis pubo analis pubo vesicalis or pubo vesinalis the origin of the pubo coccygeous muscle is from the posterior surface of body of pubis to pelvic surface of the ischial spine so this is a linear origin and it also arises from the white line of pelvic fascia or arcus tendinus the insertion of the pubo coccygeous proper is into the ano coccygeal raphe and tip of coccyx the pubo rectalis part forms a sling so it joins with the posterior fibers of deep part of sphincter and externus and this part is felt for rectal examination in the pubo analis part it blends with the longitudinal muscle coat of the anal canal at the anorectal junction that is between the sphincter and externus and internus the pubo vesicalis or vaginal part vaginalis part runs by the side of prostate or urethra and vagina and gets attached to the perineal body the pubo rectal is part is socially important and it is responsible for the fetal continence because of its continuous contracted state and it is separated by the s234 nerves coming to the ilio coccygeous part it arises from the ilium and also from the white line of pelvic fascia or arcus tendinus and it is inserted into the sides of lower two pieces of coccyx and anococcygeal raphe and it is supplied by the s4 nerve its action is along with the pubo coccygeus coming to the ischio coccygeous or coccygeous muscle it arises from the tip of ischial spine on the pelvic surface and the sacro tuberous ligament and it is inserted into the last piece of sacrum and upper two pieces of coccyx the ischio coccygeous it prevents backward displacement of coccyx by pulling it forwards during the acts of defecation and parturition now coming to the various openings in the pelvic diaphragm there is hiatus urogenitalis this is the one which is triangular and anteriorly placed through which 
comes out into the perineum, the urethra, and the vagina behind urethra in females. Then posteriorly is the hiatus rectoris, which is round in shape and is at the anorectal junction. These two are the normal openings. Sometimes an abnormal opening will be seen, which is known as the hiatus of Schwalb. And it is seen when the levator ani fails to originate from the obturator fascia. In such situation, there will be a gap between the obturator fascia and tendinous arc through which herniation of pelvic viscera into ischial rectal fossa can take place. So hiatus of Schwalb is an abnormal opening and see when the levator ani fails to originate from the obturator fascia. And this opening will be seen between the obturator fascia and tendinous arc. Through this opening, herniation of pelvic viscera into ischiorectal fossa takes place. Now let us see the orientation or the arrangement of musculature along the rectum and anal canal for a better understanding of this region. From deep to superficial, the structures that will be seen around the rectum and anal canal or the puborectalis muscle, a part of the pubococcygeus you are seeing at the junction of the rectum and this is the anal canal. Then there is the deep part of the external anal sphincter. Then next superficial to it is the superficial part of the external anal sphincter will be seen. Then will be the subcutaneous part of the anal sphincter will be seen. So in this picture you can see the rectum, the anal canal and the anal opening you are seeing. So around these components will be the fibers muscular arrangement that are seen from the deep to superficial or the puborectalis, deep part of external anal sphincter, the superficial part of external anal sphincter and the subcutaneous part of anal sphincter starting from the pelvis side to perineal side. Now let us understand the relations of the pelvic diaphragm. So the upper surface or pelvic surface is concave and it is sloping downwards, forwards and medially and it is covered by a fascia known as the endopelvic fascia. And this surface is related to the urinary bladder, rectum, prostate in males and uterus in females. Coming to the lower surface of the pelvic diaphragm, which is convex and it is covered by a fascia known as the anal fascia. And this forms the medial boundary for the ischiorectal fossa. So you are seeing a wedge shaped fossa in relation with the perineum and its relation with the pelvic diaphragm you can see the obturator, internus, forming a lateral boundary and the levator and a covered with anal fascia forming the medial boundary. Now let us see the functions of the pelvic diaphragm. So they are supporting the pelvic viscera. The pelvic diaphragm contracts the downward thrust by the descent of diaphragm during the increased intra-abdominal pressure, so which happens during coughing, sneezing and when one is lifting heavy weights. 
It also acts as a sphincter for the rectum and vagina. The anterior fibers of pelvic diaphragm, that is the pubococcygeus part mainly, it has a compressive role on the urethra, which is an important factor in urinary continence. In the case of males, it gives a component known as the levator prostate, which elevates prostate and the neck of blood. In females, it forms a sphincter around the vagina and constricts the vagina. It also gives support to the vaginal wall, preventing the downward displacement of uterus that results in prolapse of the uterus. The coccygeus part is important in the defecation and in parturition as it pulls the coccyx forwards when it is displaced posteriorly during the acts of defecation and parturition. Let us continue with the functions. The puborectalis muscle component of the pubococcygeus, it forms a sling at the rectoanal junction which you can see in this picture starting from the posterior surface of body of pubis and going posteriorly and winding around at the rectoanal junction and this is a relaxed during the act of defecation so that the rectum and anal canal will be made straight. There is a component known as the puboanal sink. During defecation, it elevates the anus. In the case of parturition, the puborectal sink plays an important role. The fetal head will be resting on this puborectal sink and the forward rotation of head of the fetus into lower part of birth canal is facilitated by the puborectal sling. The pubococcygeus part has a role in maturation and it relaxes when there is increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. The bladder neck will descend followed by contraction of the detrosor, muscle of the urinary bladder occurs. The pelvic diaphragm is subjected to great stress during the childbirth or parturition and it sometimes is damaged or weakened. If there is a weak pelvic diaphragm, it can result in prolapse of uterus or rectum. In this picture, you can see the normal rectum. In this one, you can see the prolapse of the rectum protrusion downwards into the anal opening. This is the rectal prolapse. And in this picture, you can see the prolapse of the uterus per vagina. This is the vaginal orifice. And you can see the opening of the cervix, that is the external os of the cervix that has projected through the vagina to the outside. This is called the prolapse of the uterus. So now you have understood about the normal anatomy of the pelvic diaphragm and how it is supporting the pelvic viscera and how it is facilitating the acts of maturation, the defecation and parturition and its clinical importance. One word about the evolution of the pelvic diaphragm. In quadrupeds, it is concerned with the movement of tail. So the movement forward between the hind limbs is by pubococcygeus and side to side movement is by ilio and ischiococcygeus components. In the case of orthograde animals, tail persists as coccygeus. So the insertion of pubo and iliococcygeae will be shifted to 
around anal canal and that is forming the levator anal muscle. 